quilty friends, it's Carolina Moore, your favorite sewing and quilting YouTuber, and today I'm going to show you the magic way to fold your fabric so you get perfect bias binding strips every single time. You ready? Let's get started. Okay, so I have my big piece of fabric that I'm going to use for my bias binding, and then I have a fabric cutting ruler and then a fabric cutting rotary cutter. And that's really all that we're going to need here. Um, if you've never done bias binding versus traditional binding, the difference between bias binding and traditional binding is the way that we're cutting the fabric. So I'm going to show you a traditional cut on our binding. So this is my fabric here. And if I were to cut this for traditional binding, what, well, I'll do it one side. Okay. We're going to line up one edge, this is the folded edge, with a line on the mat. And then I'm going to bring this other end up so that I have a folded end that is on the mat. And I'm doing this because my mat is not big enough the way it sits on my table to cut the full with the fabric. So I have to fold it over. And as long as this line here and this folded line here are both lined up with lines on the mat, then any cuts that I do this way that are at a 90 degree angle will be at a 90 degree angle here and will be at a 90 degree angle here. And that's going to give you perfect cuts. So I'm going to square off the end. And this would be traditional cut binding. And I like two inch binding. So I'm going to do two inch here. I get a lot of questions about what size binding is the right size binding. Um, I see people do two inch. I see people do two and a quarter. I see people do two and a half. All of those sizes are sizes that I see people use all the time. So really it's the size that works best for you. Find a couple quilts, see what's working for you and what's not, and play with it. I used to always do two and a half inch binding because that's what I was taught, but I felt like my bindings were loose. Um, and so now I've done almost always two inch binding. So this is a piece of straight cut two inch binding. And if you try to stretch this binding, um, there's not much give to this binding, this fabric. And that's because it's cut on the grain of the fabric, especially when we're doing any kind of binding that's going around a curve. Um, we want a bias binding. So I'm going to show you how you, instead of just doing straight cut, we're going to do this on the bias. So you're going to take your piece of fabric and you're going to unfold it so that you have your full width of fabric. Normally fabric comes off the bolt folded, we're gonna completely unfold it. So this is salvage end on one end, salvage end on the other end. It's full salvage that we're, like salvage to salvage, no fold. And then we're going to take and fold this at an angle so that we have a cut end and a salvage end meeting up with one another. And I squared off this end so I should get a nice clean fold on here. I can just bring this up. There we go. Okay, so I'm bringing this and I'm fiddling with it so that I can get, you can see that point isn't quite right. So I'm gonna get that point. So this is my squared off end, and then this is one salvage end, and they're together. And so what I've done here is this fold right here is the bias. That is your 45 degree angle. That's exactly what we're looking for. And we're going to want this, but trying to cut along this whole long bias is hard because I mean, that's a really long ruler. So basically we're going to do what we did when we cut the straight cut binding which is we're going to fold, but here we know that this bias edge is straight, whereas with the other one, we hadn't squared up our end yet. So we're going to just fold the two, um, 
fold it along the bias and now we've got two layers of this folded end and then it's still too big for my mat so I can just go ahead and fold it again and I want all of these edges and it doesn't matter which side is up but I'm adjusting it flipping it over just so that whatever end is easier now I'm going to show this right here you can see there's a little kind of pucker in there and that's going to create a mess when I try to cut this on the bias. So you want to make sure that everything is smooth and clean. You have a nice edge here and I can feel these lumps so I'm trying to just smooth everything out. It might take a second and that's okay. This is something that you want to take. If it takes a minute, it takes a minute. I'm trying to feel because I can feel the kind of bulges in the fabric and it should be totally smooth. This is a really good chance to pet your fabric. Okay, so it doesn't matter if this side's up or I'll flip it so you can just see what my other side looks like. That side is up. It does not matter. And now we're going to take this on our mat. And if I've done a good job, when I line this folded edge up with my mat, This edge should be, and it's a little off. So, yep, I can see why. When I flipped it, there we go. Okay, so let's try that again. This is my double check that if I line up this edge along one of these horizontal lines on the mat, this should be lined up as well. That looks pretty good. Okay, now that I have everything lined up, I'm going to square off this end. And squaring off just means kind of cutting off the edge so that everything is lined up. So we square off that end. And now we should be able to cut beautiful, again, I'm doing two inch strips. So two inch strips. If you're someone who always wants to cut based on the lines on your ruler and never on the lines of your mat, because I'm doing the lines of my mat, we could turn this around or I could just walk to the other side of the, the table to be able to measure this because I'm right-handed. Um, so, or I could just take my whole mat and turn the whole mat. Um, but I'm just going to use the lines on my mat because I'm not that stressed about it. So I'm going to cut these bias strips. And if you want, after cutting the first one, you can already double check that did I do it right? Do I have um, a nice clean bias strip? How many strips you need is completely dependent on the size of your quilt. So that would be the perimeter all the way around your quilt. Um, but you will get these beautiful strips. And look, there's one. And there's two of these really just they're perfect bias strips. And if we look at this, you ready? Look at all that stretch that you get in there. And that's exactly what you need when you are doing any kind of fancy bindings. So going around curves, um, doing inset corners on your binding, you need bias binding. So we'll just go ahead and keep cutting our strips. The next question that comes up is, how do you sew these strips together to make your binding? So we're going to sew these together and then we're going to press them to make a fully complete um, binding that's ready to go, that's ready to put on our quilt. So I'm going to cut these and just keep cutting down. And some people just prefer to use bias binding regardless of if they just have a regular rectangle shaped quilt, they still prefer a bias binding. They feel that it goes on smoother for them. Um, that's totally allowed. You're allowed to fall in love with bias binding and use it all the time. Bias binding can be your default binding that you always use. Or if straight cut binding is just easier for you to cut, straight cut binding could be your default binding that you use almost all the time, unless you have a special situation where bias binding is really what you need. So if you're binding around curves, those kinds of things. Okay, so I have my strips that are all cut. 
and I'm ready to stitch them together, I'm going to bring it over to the sewing machine. If you have a quarter inch foot with a guide or any foot with any kind of guide on your machine, you'll want to swap that out for a foot that doesn't have a guide. So I put the J foot here on a baby lock jubilant and I'm going to grab one strip of fabric and then another strip of fabric and I'm going to put them right sides together. Now there are some common, I guess, fallacies or easy mistakes to make when putting two binding strips together and one is, oh look, they kind of like match up like this. Or if I grab the other end, um, sometimes you'll get situations where they could match up or they could not match up. Um, the easiest way to remember how to put two strips together, whether this is bias binding or regular binding, is just cross them over one another and you want to sew a diagonal so that the two sides that you're keeping, which is your long ends, and the two sides that you're going to cut off, which is your short ends, are on opposite sides of the line. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to put it under my sewing machine. I'm going to eyeball this, but you can absolutely draw a line if that's your preference, or you can put diagonal seam tape on your machine to be able to guide you as you sew these binding strips together. And I'm going to sew down this. So on the left side of my machine are the two strips that I'm keeping. And on the right side of my machine are the two strips that I'm going to cut off. So I'm going to just sew my quarter inch. So I've sewn that and we're not worried about quarter inch. Um, we can keep sewing more and I'll show you how to chain piece in a second, but I just want to show you what this looks like. So when you open this up, you have your full binding strip ready to go. So once you've done two that you've sewn together, you find an end, it doesn't matter which one, and you repeat this process adding another binding strip on. Now, if you have a directional fabric, you might want to pay attention to, you know, if all your trees need to face a certain way that they are facing the same way, but this is not a directional fabric, so I am not worried about it on this one. And I'm just going to take my two pieces, put them under the machine, and so. And then this is the end that I'm adding on to. This is my new end. So I'm going to grab another strip, put them right sides together. And again, sew across that diagonal. Now, as you do this, you might want to look at some super fabric sparing methods. I've got my selvage here, so I don't want the selvage in there. I do want that one trimmed off. But bringing this closer so that I'm still cutting off that selvage, but I don't need the full point here. And then also I can bring this down a bit. and that saves a little more fabric. Let me get this eyeballed up. And we will keep sewing all these strips together until we have one long strip of binding, and then we get to trim and press in half to make a complete binding strip that we can use on our quilt. Okay, I've sewn together all of my bias binding spaghetti and I need to find an end, doesn't matter which one, somewhere in here there should be, well there should be two ends, <laughs> one on each end, and I just need to, there we go, here's one of those ends. And I like to trim, press open my seams, and press my binding in half all at the same time. I think it's just easier to just do it all along the same process because all three of those parts require um, going along the entire length of your binding. And so I'll just go along the whole length of my binding once. 
doing all the different steps. So I have my little Aliso iron here and she's heating up and getting ready to press my binding strips. And I've got the front of my binding. I'm gonna put the right side of my binding down. So it's wrong side up and I'm going to fold it in half. And we talked about this binding being stretchy. We don't wanna stretch it here. We wanna give it gentle hands. Usually I starch my fabric. I don't starch my binding fabric because I want it to have a little more give for when I apply the binding. Now there are all kinds of gadgets and tools out there to help you fold your binding in half and press it. I am a, I'm a notions junkie as I'm sure anyone who's watched this channel for five minutes knows. I love good notions. I love terrible notions. I just, I love, I, I have an entire podcast called I love notions because I love notions and I don't have a binding folder tool. I just do it by hand. It's binding is not my favorite part. So a notion isn't going to really improve it for me. I think when I get to the spot where I have the seam of two of them coming together, I'll cut and I'll just eyeball a quarter inch seam allowance. If you're not quite sure how big a quarter inch, go slightly bigger. You don't want to go too much bigger because this seam allowance is going to be bulk. And then you want to trim off the dog ear on this side and the dog ear on this side. And that just means that we're going to trim it to the strip. And I've got some extra threads in here, so let's get those extra threads out because those won't do me any favors when I apply the binding. And I'll say, why didn't I remove those threads? So let's do it now. Okay, so I have that trimmed up seam and we're going to press open. Now, even if you're someone who is a die hard side presser, if you're someone who says, um, if I can't press it to the side, then I don't want to make it, get it. You're allowed to do that. In, I, I mean, it's your quilt. You are allowed to do that here if you really want. But the reason that we are pressing this open, and this seems specifically just really need to be pressed open, is because this right here, we now have two layers going right here. And when I fold this over, in this area right here where that seam is, I'm going to have four layers. So that is a lot of extra bulk. And if I were to press it to the side, right here I would have three layers. And when I press this over, right here I would have six layers of fabric. And especially with fabric that's thicker, and this is our gallery fabrics, so it's super fine, good quality fabric. But especially for fabric that is thicker, um, you can end up with kind of a bulge or a lump on the edge of your binding. So we press it open and that way we don't worry about that lump or bulge. For people who are die hard side pressers, a big reason is because when you press open, you end up having basically no, um, there's nothing behind here. There's no, you can't stitch in the stitch because there is nothing there to stitch in. You're stitching on air if you're stitching in this stitch. Um, and pressing to the side protects that so that there's always fabric. You don't end up with holes in your quilt. But with binding, we are doubling it up. So there is a layer behind here that is protecting that. And so you will not end up with holes in your quilt from pressing open because this is a binding that's being folded in half. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, um, so we'll keep pressing this. Now there's a question of, is this called single fold binding or is this called double fold binding? And I used to have a really hard time remembering what is single fold binding and what is double fold binding, which is which, right? When I'm reading a pattern, it says use single fold binding. I, I, I don't know. Okay. Single fold binding is when this attaches to your project, how many layers are on the fold of your quilt. So in this case, when this attaches to the quilt, it's going to attach around the edge of the quilt. There are going to be two layers of fabric. So this is called double fold binding because there's a double layer at the fold. Um, even though the other kind of binding that's called single fold binding, um, 
the single fold binding, let me grab a piece of this binding here so you can see, single fold binding actually has one side go in like this, one side go in like this, and then this is what wraps around your quilt like that. But then there's just one layer of fabric there at the fold, which is why that is called single fold binding. So hopefully that makes some sense. Okay, now I'm gonna show you a faster way of trimming this off. The first time that I trimmed this off, I trimmed it and I just showed you um, cutting across and then cutting off your dog ears. But you can actually clip a dog ear, cut across, clip a dog ear. So I'm doing three cuts all at once to trim up that binding edge. And then when I get to it, I can press it open and then press it in half. And I have threads again, no big deal. Let's get rid of those. All right, so I'm going to, again, press my seam open and then keep pressing down my binding. Now this does take a little bit of time, um, which is part of the reason that binding is people's least favorite part of quilting for so many people because it's the thing that's keeping the quilt from being finished. Y'all, you, you cut all the fabric, which took forever. You sewed all those pieces together, which, you know, took forever. And then you quilted it, which either you sent it to a long arm and then had to wait, maybe patiently, maybe not, for your quilt to come back, or you quilted it yourself, which is also a whole process. You then squared it up and you still have to add the binding. It's that one final step before you get to call your quilt a quilt. Although technically you still need to add a label at some point. So, but you can snuggle with a quilt that doesn't have a label. It's a little trickier to snuggle with a quilt that doesn't have binding. However, I do know people who will surge around on the edges of their quilt um, and then maybe never get around to adding binding, which I'm not advocating for that, but it's a choice and it's your quilt and you get to use it however you want. Um, so yeah, binding, not everyone's favorite. It takes a little bit of time, but it's worth doing right. The edges of your quilt are what get the most wear and tear because they get rubbed against all the time. They're the, those, they're the edges. So having good double fold binding on there. And then in this case, taking the time to do a bias binding for a specialty edge, it's just worth it. But before I head off, I want to give you one more piece of information, which is how do you store this? Now there are all kinds of notions and tools and ways that you can store your binding. You can put it on pretty spools and I have, um, there are lots of options out there, but if I'm going to be using it in the next little bit, I just wrap it around my hand and I create just like a, a roll or a spool around my hand. Um, and then that's fairly easy to bring to my sewing machine and be able to use on my quilt. So I just roll it around my hand and then that last little bit, I'll usually just wrap around. So that way I have a nice tidy piece of binding that isn't as big <laughs> bird's nest that I'm trying to carry around. Um, and then a lot of people, they like to prep their binding while it's at the long armor. So you might be making your binding and not applying it for a couple weeks or even a couple months, depending on how backed up your long armor is. So finding a way to store it. And there are lots of really cute binding storage options as well. So if you have extra pieces of binding, you might want to find also really cute binding storage for those. Now make sure you're subscribed to this channel. I am going to be sharing how I use this binding on a special day edge quilt. So you don't want to miss that. And I have lots more videos about quilting and quilting projects, blocks, tips, all of that. You don't want to miss it. Make sure you are subscribed. Give this video a thumbs up. Let YouTube and other people know that this is a video that they're going to want to check out uh, and leave any questions or comments below. I'm absolutely here to try to help you out and answer your questions. So questions and comments are totally welcome. Leave those down below. Friends, that's it for today. I'll see you right here real soon. Bye for now.